all this, it's like, it's wood basically. It's inedible. This right here, they can eat. They can eat this and they can eat that. It's gotta be green with some moisture content though. Your soil, that's your, that's like your, your savings account. That's the supplies right there. When you run into a problem and you say, what the hell happened to this pasture? It's not producing anything anymore. And at least you have data to work with. You can, you can go back and, and uh, you have all the puzzle pieces to assemble. Is there a reason you're taking samples so close to where the pipeline is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. You gotta be able to describe how that it affected you. And this is where the pipeline cuts through. That's it. This was a long, long time ago. There was nothing except what we call darkness. Darkness is not nothing. And during that time, there was a spirit who got lonely, who in order to create, had to create of itself. This spirit began to spin very violently. And in that process, uh, Mother Earth was created. The universe, the natural universe was created. His blood became water. His blood is water. And he sacrificed his own blood so that we could have life. Water is the bloodline of Mother Earth. So for us, these sacred connections to the natural universe are everything. They are us. We are nothing without them. North America, home to around 600 million people, is a place whose influence is felt around the globe. Miles of pipeline run across the continent some 2.5 million in the U.S. alone, crisscrossing various terrain, bodies of water of every size, and land that is often close to what we call home. The Permian Basin in West Texas is compromised of sedimentary layers beneath the Earth's surface, where heat and pressure have turned decaying plants and animals into oil and gas. Extracting natural gas begins by pumping a mixture of fresh water and clay around a drill to maintain pressure and push the drill deeper some 10 to 15,000 feet beneath land, rivers, and reserves of drinking water. Another pipe is used to blow small holes into the sedimentary layer before pumping a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals into the shale, fracturing the rock and releasing the gas into the pipe so it can move to the surface. This process is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, and is repeated several times in each drilled hole. And with the fractures expanding, dangerous chemicals like brine are brought closer to the surface. The extracted gas is finally filtered above ground and transported via pipelines, like the Trans-Pecos pipeline, for our everyday use. The Bakken Formation in North Dakota was one of the largest discoveries of oil in North American history, yielding an estimated 1 million barrels per day at its peak of production. It spurred many crude oil pipelines that twist and turn across the continent, including the Dakota Access Pipeline. The same drilling process is used for oil as for natural gas. Once fractures have been blown into the earth, oil is drained and processed in refineries, and then funneled through pipelines that traverse mountains, rivers, and cityscapes, 
to where it is used in our everyday life. The Athabasca tar sands in northern Alberta, Canada, near Fort McMurray and Fort Mackay, produce bitumen, a natural petroleum that lies not far beneath the surface. The bitumen, a black tarry substance, is naturally mixed with the sand, so after mining the surface with massive machines tearing away the land, some as big as two-story houses, the bitumen is transported into nearby plants where hot water is mixed with the sand to separate the bitumen. The leftover water is contaminated and stored in man-made tailing ponds throughout the land, while the bitumen is shipped by truck, rail, and pipeline, like the Keystone Pipeline to various refineries where it will be distilled into light crude oil that is used for a variety of things. There are a whole web of pipelines now going in. The thing to know about these pipelines is that they are a last ditch effort by the fossil fuel industry to lock in infrastructure in the final years before it becomes utterly apparent to everyone what a bad idea this is. The fossil fuel industry just will not let go of its greed and profiteering. Big Bend region is truly the last best place in Texas. It's one of the last best places anywhere. It is a region of mountain islands and desert seas, sweeping skies, a lot of ecological integrity in ways that we don't have anywhere else in the state. And it's truly the last place in the state that's not industrialized. At least it wasn't until this pipeline came. For drilling, I mean, there's a lot of mineral resources out here. And then the Permian Basin, that's one of the world's largest oil reserves. There's something like 39 billion barrels of oil have come out of there. That's what makes this area so significant. fence that Pumpco constructed. We had a property line fence that was three feet uh, this side of the, this very expensive fence that they constructed. I live right next door to the Pumpco construction site. Pumpco is the subcontractor who actually builds the pipelines for the Trans-Pecos group. They were running all kinds of equipment over there. It was just a freaking equipment rodeo for about the better part of two years. Well, it unfolded on March 31st, 2015, when uh, the pump co equipment started rolling in and they cut the fence line and just started moving into the property and immediately started clearing it. This whole house shook. I really thought the house was gonna fall down. I actually did. But at the time, it was so outrageous that we really didn't think it would happen. A 42-inch pipeline through this region, enough to, to power a town of six million people, that's insane. Safety-wise, they could have avoided this town altogether. I guess I would say that I was rather naive about the pipeline business because there's never been a pipeline in the Big Bend, never. Midland, Odessa, yes, that's the oil patch. The reason we live here and not in Midland, Odessa, is we didn't want to be part of the oil patch. My most naivete was about the principle of eminent domain. I was just not aware <laughs> that a private nonprofit company had the right to use eminent domain. I knew that the state did, but I somehow thought they exercised that when they were building interstates, when cities were building hospitals, schools, 
things of that nature. I have rancher friends who have had their property taken away from them and ruined, ruined permanently for this oil company. Eminent domain, which allows federal, state, and provincial government to take privately owned land for public use, was used to obtain land for the route of the Trans-Pecos Pipeline. Being fully operational since March 2017, the Trans-Pecos Pipeline sits beneath the surface and carries natural gas from Fort Stockton, Texas, some 143 miles south to Mexico, where it passes dangerously close to towns like Alpine, Texas. And the first bag of garbage that their PR people tried to load off on us was the fact that they'd be cutting a swath of land through here. And when it was over with, they'd put it back just like it was or better, which is impossible. It, you know, that can't be done, you know. So if it talks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it looks like a duck, call it a duck. Don't lie. What that all translated to ultimately was a corporate pipeline that was going to take people's land by eminent domain for private gain. Our pristine Big Ben has a 42-inch pipeline running through it, and we're all afraid that when one pipeline comes, what's to stop another pipeline? I'm still not sure that there hasn't been permanent damage done to the house, but it certainly damaged me. I felt really intimidated by it. You know, we're at the very eastern edge of the Basin Range province. And so that's where you get mountains and intervening desert basins. And because of that and the elevational changes that we have, we have an incredible ecological diversity here. And that translates into archeological diversity. And I think even into modern times, probably into some cultural diversity that we wouldn't have elsewhere. And so any way you cut it, any way you look at it, this place is really special incredibly special, the crown jewel of the state of Texas, and far too special to be sacrificed for the oil and gas industry. Separating Texas and the United States from northern Mexico is the Rio Grande River. originates in Colorado and stretches into the Gulf of Mexico. The Trans-Pecos Pipeline runs beneath the Rio Grande River next to the border towns of Presidio, Texas and Ojinaga, Mexico. Yo tengo entendido que, bueno, yo, yo yendo para Chihuahua, he visto las tuberías a un costado de la, de la carretera. El gasoducto que pasa por Ojinaga lo veo como algo muy bueno porque se requiere esa infraestructura para, para que llegue el gas a, a la termoeléctrica allá al encino. Y necesariamente tiene que pasar por aquí. Y no trae nada de, de malo porque la gente tiene muchos, muchos prejuicios, cree que por su ignorancia cree que, que es un peligro y no, no es un peligro porque tiene que ver mucho la cultura de, de, una, de las personas y si nos oponemos a ese gasoducto estamos perjudicando ese proyecto que es, que es en beneficio para la generación de energía eléctrica. Pues Ojinaga para mí es, es algo muy importante porque en primer lugar yo nací aquí en Ojinaga entonces eh, por eso me, me, a mí me emociona esta, esa construcción del, porque se ve que va a haber mucho progreso. Mucha gente no, no ve eso, o sea, pero va a haber mucho progreso en Ojinaga. Esto es el comienzo. Un gasoducto puede traer muchas, muchas inversiones para Ojinaga. Pueden venir a automotrices que fabriquen automóviles usados con gas. Puede haber mucho dinero, puede haber... O sea, lo que viene va a ser algo muy bueno para Ojinaga. Es necesario, o sea, tenemos que... Ojinaga tiene que despegar industrialmente, tiene que llamar inversiones y todo eso en cadena va a producir mucho beneficio para Ojinaga. Ahorita no lo vemos, incluso no, la gente no sabe.
As you drive between Presidio and Marfa, you can see that the uh, right of way where the pipeline was laid. I would prefer, this, just the same as anybody else, that we could have gone without having to, to, to make such a you know big cut in the earth to, to, to make this happen. Presidio, we, you know, I guess we're, we're, we're kind of lucky in that that project, again, that was a project that, that was kind of, you know, it's like, okay, this project's gonna happen. And so we, we kind of, hey, can we, can we not have a little straw and have a little bit of natural gas off that, that line, okay? No se debe ver países, se debe ver beneficios, porque nos, ta, nos costaría mucho traerlo a otra parte. Eh, y al fin, al último, pues, ten, el, el que pagaría fue, sería el ciudadano. O sea, no, no, hay que estar de tener una, una mente abierta de que el, cuando es lo mejor para, para la región, o para un país, o para lo que sea, hay que aceptar que, que, que esa es la mejor decisión. No importa dónde venga el gas. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. I think they've done a pretty good job of, now that they've covered it up, you know, they've, they've tried to, to, to put it back as best they could. And I'm hopeful that the, the desert will, will be able to come back and, and to a reasonable degree uh, recover. If you look around here, you see the sort of rural scenery, rural setting that North Dakota has, has been for decades. Behind us is an oil and gas well, a Bakken well. If you look to the immediate northwest, there is a farm and a rig beyond it. And there is a proposed refinery, crude oil refinery, that ultimately is expected to produce about 50,000 barrels a day. This proposed refinery is within five miles of the South Unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park, a national park that belongs to all of us. It's named for Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president. He's probably the most closely associated with conservation ever of any president we've ever had. Bakken Formation lies beneath parts of North Dakota, Montana, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. With the advent of hydraulic fracturing, a major boom in oil production from the Bakken followed. Bakken oil reserves spurred the Dakota Access Pipeline and have caused the landscape, especially in North Dakota, to be dominated by oil and gas wells and pumps. the Little Missouri State Scenic River. It is the maker of the Badlands and has been doing so for tens of thousands of years. We're in a drought this year, a severe drought in much of western North Dakota, and you can see that in the river. The Little Missouri most of the time is a very small river. In most years, you can float the river in a kayak or a canoe or a raft until about mid-June. It's usually drier in the summer. There are times, like right now, you can walk across the river. Even at this point, when it's as low as you see it now, it is being used for industrial fracking water to frack oil and gas wells. Water is essential for fracking and drilling. Due to high demand from extraction activities in the Bakken, water is often taken from local rivers, streams, and creeks. My concern is that the landscape and the critters that, that live on it 
And the people that um, look to it for their livelihood would have first dubs, not fracking water. People gain their own connections to places, and they do it in their own way. Preservation is important not only ecologically to support habitat and wildlife species, but also to give people a place to go to escape from cities, technology, and things like that, but to give them a connection to our cultural heritage as well as our natural heritage, because if you don't experience it firsthand, it's harder to relate to it and to want to preserve it. I think most any North Dakotan, whether it's somebody that lives in Watford City or they live in Fargo, you mentioned the park and they perk. You know, it's the park, it's our park. But there are also people that have never been there. And what concerns me about that is that they are not aware of what is really happening out here next to or within their public lands. If they had that in-your-face recognition, I really think the majority of North Dakotans would say there are some places in our state where there just shouldn't be oil and gas development. I guess I should have a life jacket on. This is the, the confluence of the Clearwater and the Athabasca River. This is where it meets right here. We were kids swimming in the river in the snow and into the local streams around McMurray. Uh, on a hot summer day, you'd come out, you'd have be covered with little black dots of oil all over you. You'd go home and you'd just use lard to clean it off. But that was in its natural state. It was, it was, that's the way it was. Nobody ever thought much about it. Hot days, you can see it, it'll start to ooze out in some places, not all. Not all areas, of course. It just depends on the concentrate of it in the particular areas. The saying was that the Aboriginal used to use it for patching canoes. Mining in the tar sands began in the 1960s, initially producing nearly 45,000 barrels of oil per day as operations continued to expand. By 2012, an estimated 1.8 million barrels were being extracted from the tar sands and exported around the world for use. Because oil from the tar sands is exported globally, pipelines are essential for quick transportation. The Keystone Pipeline from Canada's tar sands into the U.S. currently runs 2,925 miles. The proposed Keystone XL would be shorter, covering 1,179 miles, but the pipeline was blocked by President Obama on November 6, 2015. The tar sands lie under an area 142,000 square kilometers is what's available to be leased. That's an area the size of the state of Florida, or as large as England, that can be sold off to, to multinational oil companies. 
So that is a tremendous threat just in its own, and we've already seen the scars that tar sands operations leave. Rivers are diverted, wetlands are, are drained, and these vast open pit mines are created. From a climate perspective, the tar sands are the single reason why Canada isn't living up to its climate commitments right now is because of the growth and the expected growth in tar sands operations. You look at water impacts, and so you have these huge tar sands tailing lakes that now span over 160 square kilometers of our province and are getting bigger. They're leaking into underground aquifers and directly into the Athabasca River. And then in downstream communities, we're seeing health impacts, everything from rare cancers to asthma and respiratory diseases to significant impacts on, on culture and traditional way of life. Leaks from tailing ponds into the Athabasca River occur regularly, threatening some 68,000 people in Fort McMurray and Fort Mackay before reaching those in the Northwest Territories. If we didn't have what we had here, if you were to lift everything out of here, you, you, you just can't imagine the impact it would have all over the world. You know, money don't go on trees, guys. You've got to have industry. You've got to have something to create wages and money for, for people to live. It's Canada's oil resource, and if it's not used for local, the profits come back to the country, the profits come back to the companies, they come back to the province. So it's a fundamental part of the economy of Alberta. But at the same time, ethically, morally, environmentally, we know that it is extraordinarily harmful to the planet. I've heard many people who are critical of the tar sands, and then someone will come along and say, hey, do you like schools? Do you like health care? Because without the tar sands, you may not have schools and health care. I've fished this river all my life. I've eaten fish out of it all my life. And I drink water out of it. It's nothing wrong with it. It's no, no different than any river anywhere else in North America. In fact, I'll guarantee you that this river is cleaner than most of the rivers down east in western states. Pipelines are trouble for two reasons. They're all local. The places where whatever is going in the pipeline comes from, like the tar sands up in Canada and the places it traverses, the rivers and aquifers that it could pollute, the land that it takes from farmers and ranchers. But the bigger source of trouble in the end is what happens if all that oil or gas moves through the pipeline without any spills without any trouble and reaches the other end and gets refined and burned in a car engine someplace or a power plant. When that happens, it pours the carbon into the atmosphere that is powering the disintegration of the planet's climate system. That's the biggest challenge that the world faces today and pipelines are a kind of speeded up way of making sure that we get as much carbon out of the ground and into the atmosphere as we possibly can. If they burned all the oil that was up there in the tar sands in Canada, it would be game over for the climate. That alone would be enough to put sufficient carbon in the atmosphere to break the back of the climate system. And the fuse to this one was the Keystone Pipeline laid down to the Gulf of Mexico. The Keystone Pipeline leaked 210,000 barrels of oil in South Dakota on November 16th, 2017. On March 24th, President Trump signed an executive order to approve the Keystone XL pipeline in agreement with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's wishes to expand Canada's tar sands industry. The Keystone XL will carry 830,000 barrels of oil a day from Alberta, Canada into Nebraska, where it will continue on to the Gulf Coast. As much as these pipelines were a map of destruction, they were also a map of resistance, and, and now we're connected to communities right across the continent. The fossil fuel industry is the richest industry in the world. That money buys it more political power than it deserves. So it's taken enormous courage of people to stand up against it. I think we've by now demonstrated that when we stand up, we're able to sometimes at least 
hold it to a draw or beat it, that people power can stand up to organized money and sometimes successfully. Y'all working on stolen land. We caught wind of a pipeline coming. The route that we saw placed it within a quarter mile of my home, this home. And that concerned me because the research that I was doing was showing that a 42 inch gas pipeline, 1200 PSI, will explode and has a 1500 foot blast radius, which includes my home and many other homes of my friends. That kind of risk factor being placed so near my home without me getting to say anything about it just infuriated me. See, this is one of the reasons why we shut it down early was not too many people could handle this heat. Two Rivers Camp was a resistance camp established along the route of the Trans-Pecos Pipeline to stop any progress or development. Since the pipeline's completion in March 2017, the camp has been deserted. It's kind of like looking at the ruins, you know, at the end of a war or something, and then be like, okay, What's next? Where's the hope in the rubble? And it's in there. It feels sad. I miss the the unity of purpose. We had one thing that we had decided that we were going to push up against that represented many things, and it felt like the right thing to do. And, um, and now it's over. The people that put the stones here, one of the men was actually a pediatrician from New Mexico, and he said each of these stones was like an intention or a prayer. The native path involves a lot of prayer and being guided by the spirits to what is the best thing to do next. So as you're walking the path, you're thinking, you know, guide me, guide me, Chikashla, guide me, Earth, guide me, um, grandfathers and grandmothers, and I will wait for the answers. How are we going to move forward on this? There are many options, and I'm waiting for the spirits to let me know which one is the best. On many, many different levels, we were very, very concerned about all the impacts that this pipeline could have to our region. And we really, really worked hard to fight, to, to preserve it, to conserve it, to, to get this pipeline either you know, more, more regulated, have studies done, have it stopped, you know, whatever we could do. And they're still fighting that in court 
but the white pine's already been put in the ground. I'm pleased to announce that the Dakota Access Pipeline is now officially open for business. A $3.8 billion investment in American infrastructure that was stalled. And nobody thought any politician would have the guts to approve that final leg. And I just closed my eyes and said, do it. Think of it to a company standpoint. They build this massive pipeline going for miles, then they have to hook it up a little section, and they're stopped. And I said, that's not fair. It's up, it's running, it's beautiful, it's great. Everybody's happy, the sun is still shining, the water is clean. The Dakota Access Pipeline made news worldwide because it was supposed to pass through the Standing Rock Reservation and the tribe had no say in the matter. We had two Fort Laramie treaties that we live under in North Dakota. The first treaty was the 1851 treaty and the second one was the 1868 treaty. We got the 1868 treaty because the government wanted more land and uh, didn't think the, the Native Americans needed it. The great Sioux leader Sitting Bull never signed the 1868 treaty, refused to come in, refused to give up any more land. The Indians, you know, have had basically everything that you could take from them, taken from them. So all of a sudden, the oil companies have this great pool of oil. They're looking for a cheap way to ship it. And by golly, we can go and head south. Originally, the Dapple pipeline was supposed to go right here through Bismarck. Well, you don't put the pipeline through Bismarck because the governor lives in Bismarck, but you can sure put that pipeline right down close to the reservation. The Fort Laramie Treaties established reservations and parceled land for natives to govern with the understanding that this land was theirs. Despite the Dakota Access Pipeline protests and the fight to protect the land, the pipeline was completed in June 2017 currently lies just north of Standing Rock and directly beneath the reservation's only supply of drinking water. America has almost successfully swept us under the rug. And they've tried extremely diligently to commit the worst genocide in human history, to lie about it, and then to program the very objects of that genocide to create within us the belief that we were uncivilized or that we were primitive that has a lot to do with why we are in this mess. This is a settlement, this is a, a, a town, but the only private wealth generated in the Standing Rock Nation is mostly agricultural wealth or farming and ranching. This has been a policy over the last 130 to 140 years is to create uh, private property ownership interests in Indian country. But, you know, guys like my grandfather who were um, chronic alcoholics ended up, uh, you know, being divested of those interests, selling that land. A lot of people have come to depend on the tribal government for, for crumbs and the tribal government is not depending on itself or creating its own wealth. It is dependent upon the federal government to supply all of its budgetary needs. I mean, the United States still sends rations to our people, only they don't come in a, a horse and carriage, it comes in a semi. The tar sands in Keystone will, is heavy and it sinks at the bottom, but this light Bakken crude will rise. It'll get in the food chain faster and it will move faster. The river changes a lot depending on the core operations and we're in a drought right now. So how the oil, if it got in the river, what you um, What you call an average savage? I don't have a position. I'm a concerned person with what fell upon a tribe of this Dapple pipeline that was placed on our doorstep and threatens a tribe. I want to see this thing through. What is wrong with this pipeline in regard to the risks and the threats that it brings to society, to all the millions of people downstream, to this tribe, 
to uh, the resources, to all the things that walk, all the things that crawl, all the things that swim, all the things that fly. These are our relatives, and they can't speak. They cannot defend themselves. That pipeline represents a significant threat. A leak of any kind really is a potentially significant, given the fact that there's a... Anytime a you put something that is ha a pipeline or hazardous material into the environment, then you have to do an analysis of the risks. DAPL did the environmental assessment themselves. That's like giving the keys to the hen house to the fox. It came out basically saying that it's a low risk. This pipeline coming through this part of the country, doing this thing that they had planned, is low risk. It is anything but that. We're going to have the opportunity to expose this. Dave and a team of scientists and lawyers plan to present their argument in court, stating that a fair analysis of the Dakota Access Pipeline was never conducted. We call it a snake. We don't know what kind of snake it is. We don't know how dangerous that snake is. Is it a garter snake? You know, pretty harmless snake versus a rattlesnake that is dangerous and can bite and can kill. We can't tell you right now which is the case because DAPL has hidden the design, the blueprint, so to speak, of what, what they did. The Corps of Engineers likes to pontificate about how safe the pipeline is. And there are many pipelines coming from the Bakken Channel in Western North Dakota. This is way safer than the other pipelines. And that's just not true. This expert said, that thing's out of spec. There's excessive welding all over it. And excessive welding, it would leads to leaks. If there was a spill, a worst case scenario, what would it be like? We know that would be bad because 550,000 barrels a day would go through. To really know what it's capable of doing, it's like that snake. A 30 inch pipe under tremendous pressure. Understand oil coming out of the ground in pressure, and then as it's being pumped across the land, it bolsters the pressure. It is the largest pipeline that's been built from the Bakken. It operates under much higher pressure than the smaller pipelines. So even a small breach in the pipe can actually result in a, a very large oil spill. Small leaks turn into big leaks. And North Dakota just passed a law where they don't have to report small leaks. It's unbelievable, but that, that just kind of shows you how how powerful the, this oil or the want for money, they're being driven by this force for fossil fuel. So far, the Dakota Access Pipeline has had three spills, but they weren't widely reported since they were considered small leaks and not significant. Large leaks must be five barrels or 210 gallons to be considered significant. Just like everything that humans create and develop and build and construct, if it's not properly maintained, it eventually will break down. Pipelines break, they rupture and spill. And when they do, they pollute whatever water body they're nearby. Spills are not a question of if a spill is gonna happen, it's a question of when is a spill gonna happen, how big is it gonna be, and what are the impacts gonna be. Oil and water don't mix, and we see this from the coast of Alaska, where you can still find evidence of the wreckage of the Exxon Valdez, to places like the Kalamazoo or the Yellowstone River, where these pipelines have burst and poured crude into clean water. And I see that time and time again. We go out, we do an inspection. It's like, well, you know, you're, you're leaking here. Why not? Oh, well, we don't have funds to replace it. Well, what happened to the funds? Oh, well, this was more urgent. Unfortunately, things got to be prioritized, but something like this is a potential concern.
Right away, you put me on TV. <laughs> <laughs> No, it looks. Okay, we're gonna start, this is where it started. Where it began. up there to them ah oh, I broke that tree branch damn it I'm sorry we're almost there you can see where the trees are dead they're cut it's coming up just keep following my all right my track here okay geez I hope there's no poison ivy down here no, we'll fall. go around okay yeah we'll go around it then Okay. This hole right here used to be all brine, but you can see, still see that something's right there. Brine is a salty water, 10 times more salty than ocean water and laced with chemicals and heavy metals that make it highly radioactive. It is essential for deep drilling of oil and gas in the Bakken. A brine spill kills all crops and vegetation at and around the spill site and makes it nearly impossible to regrow in the area. This brine spill in Mandarin, North Dakota occurred more than three years ago. Off the reservation, it be cleaned up. Not a matter of years, a matter of months. The water is just not too far away from here. It's only about Maybe about a mile, mile and a half downstream from here. Our main drinking water, that's where our uh, water intake is at also. Uh, where we, our community, Mandaree, gets our drinking water. Industry really influences our people. We used to be very traditional. We don't respect Mother Earth anymore, so we're losing respect for each other. Your tribal leaders don't want you to tell anything. And, I, and that's the reason, one reason why I don't work for my tribe is because they would tell me that I can't be saying what I, what I say. I really want to educate our people and our people don't understand what Brian is and our children didn't even understand that we were so impacted. Our quality of life has changed and who we are has changed a lot because now it's about money. Our children are dropping out of school because they get oil money, you know? Industry hit us so fast that nobody knows how to clean it up. Industry themselves don't even know. They just want to come and make it, do it fast and make as much money as they, as they can. They're putting the profit before people. Last year, Crestwood gave our community $1 million. Why is it we get a million dollars? Is that a, is that a dollar for every gallon they spilt back there? But we're not enforcing them to clean it up? See, even these buffalo bears are not even growing. The cedar tree behind me right here is a young cedar tree. It's not that old. It's only about 50, maybe, maybe our sold feet tall. This particular tree, uh, it, it's something that us as Native Americans use for spiritual purposes, to cleanse our homes, to cleanse ourselves. But we use it in ceremonies. And uh, it's basically sacrificed itself because it was in the chosen path of this brain. And you got all of these trees.
that have sacrificed themselves, you know. But one in particular is this one right here. Every time I go back down here, I always cry. It's not because of this tree, it's because of what's happened. But basically, looking at this right here, it's not gonna ever come back. None of this. This is our home. This is where the government put our ancestors, our people, on these reservations, in the Indian country, any native country in, in the world. This is our land. This is supposed to be our land, our last piece of land that we own, that we're supposed to protect. But instead, we're killing it. We're taking it and, and, and abusing it. I mean, there ain't gonna be nothing left. Because of the boom from the Bakken, drilling for oil and gas continues throughout North Dakota. Much of the land on reservations is still threatened, and tribal members like those in Mandaree are selling off their land for money. This land is, this is our little place in the universe. All the things that the earth is made of, we are also made of. When we allow our earth to be violated, we are violating ourselves. We can't last if we continue to do that. Something has been ruined and it cannot be replaced. It cannot be restored. There was a hell of a number done to us here. Such as it is, the way the history turned out, they gave us a little bit of land back, or designated so much for us, called reservation. This is where we are. It means everything. As soon as you lose your land base, then you're no longer people. The land under our language is what separates us. Gotta keep it. The Trans-Pecos, Dakota Axis, and Keystone are small examples of the web of pipelines crisscrossing North America. But beneath the land, there are many more that twist and turn and threaten everything we know and love. With the risk they pose, the damage they cause, and the harm they do, will we continue to allow companies and people to risk the health of our land, this land, our only planet, for their greed and profit? Or will we do something before it's too late?